Today we're going to talk about specifically how you make a living in the music <laughs> business. Now, I've talked about this in a number of videos in the past. Over the course of my channel, my situation has changed. I went from producing bands, working 12 hours, 14 hours a day, to making videos 12 or 14 hours a day. Tim has been out touring for how many years, Tim? 20-something. Those of you that don't know Tim, he was in a, we were in a video together recently, but Tim went, played bass in Jellyfish, and you've played with... Cheryl Crow for about 14 years, and... I uh, played with Neil Finn and his brother Tim Finn, the Finn Brothers, and World Party I played with for a time, and Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds for about five years. So, let's talk about this, Tim. T tell me about how, how touring has changed and, and uh, kind of your move from being in a signed band or even getting into a signed band and how what the music business was like back then with Jellyfish as to how it changed over the years. Yeah, well, back in those days, <laughs> in 92, 93, you could still get a record contract and you could get an advance and everybody could make some money off of that and you could live off of it. But as, you know, I think it's the Steve Albini post that basically says you'd make more money working at a 7-Eleven when you break everything down over the course of a, even a fairly well, a uh, record doing fairly well, you know, um, you have to get out on the road and tour and... Um, now that people don't seem to buy music the way that it was back then, uh, making music by playing live is really the main way that musicians can make a living now. And so even big bands, uh, I know that when I was playing with Noel, because he owns all of his publishing and his label and all that stuff, he's making more money because of that, which is a great decision that he made back in the Oasis days, but not everybody has that kind of cachet to... to broaden themselves out like that, but he's done it well enough to uh, to make a great living. So nowadays it seems like all the even bigger bands that I've worked with, um, because they can only really make money from touring, everybody's getting all their slices out of that. So everybody's got their fingers in that. And I think what's happened is, is that the musicians are, are I'm not going to say they're getting slighted, it's just part of the economy, the economics of what happens, but it's just not quite the same level. Without being specific about the different musicians that you've worked with, what are the percentage of people that own their own publishing? Um, that I've worked with? Yeah. Not many. Okay. Yeah. Not many. And you get these big, you know, deals that... Uh, People, a lot of bigger artists make that cover everything for a sp specific amount of time. And, um, I think people now want to hold on to their publishing, but even that world, like where do you make money in publishing now unless it's in doing commercial work or getting your stuff in film scores and stuff like that, or in a film and the soundtracks and stuff like that. What's the longest time period that you were out on tour? Uh, probably 12 weeks, something like that at one wow. time. Well, uh, mostly in my Cheryl Crow days, she just, we would do 11, do 11 nights in a row. She just, her voice never needed to rest. So we were always out and uh, it was fun. It was, what I would say, what happens now and, and some of the touring I've done where they're Nashville based groups, where it's mostly weekend touring. So you get a bus on a Thursday and overnight to play to some town, you're going to play Friday, Saturday, maybe Sunday or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then you're back and you have the first half of your week at home. And there are pros and cons to that. I, for me, I would rather be on the road and just get a momentum going because it seemed like that third show of a run, you're just getting back yeah. into grooving and playing with each other and then you're back home again. Yeah. That's my own opinion. I, it's, it's good to, if you, know, you want to be home and be with your family and stuff more often and that's a good thing to a tour like that, but I prefer being out where you're literally putting the message in a box and driving the car around the world kind of thing uh, for a whole span of time. And maybe have some breaks in there, but you know, the detriment part of that is that you're not going to see your family <laughs> unless you bring them out. Right. When's the best time to see a tour, Tim? What, what's the... Uh... Um, for me, it was always maybe the third or fourth week of being out. Once you've worked through all the normal stuff and you kind of found the right set list and you've changed a few things and you see what works best and you're not too burned out. <laughs> That's always the best time to, to watch musicians is when they're not 
Well, sometimes it can be fun when it burned out too. <laughs> <laughs> One of my first recording experiences here, or my, my first was working with Tim with Uma Jets on that record. Right. And uh, Roger worked on the record. Roger yeah. from Jellyfish, Roger, Roger Manning. Manning. Yeah. And Shalom. Averly. Yep. Engineers yeah, we just did it. We had a, what, a 1 8 app machine and a Mackie console. Yeah. And I think we had a 414 and yeah. maybe a 57. That was about it. <laughs> just moving it around. But that was really the, that's how I first saw people producing their own music before computers yeah. or anything. That was the first experience I ever had with, I mean, I had a four track cassette and things like that, but as far as actually making a record that way, yeah, uh, that was my first experience really seeing yeah. that. Yeah. If you think about that in comparison to nowadays, all the stuff that is all the, the gear for that, that is developed because of home recording. Well, I mean, that's, you know, I have this theory about, um, the ease at which things become so available, how does that serve the struggle of an artist to be creative? Mm -hmm. When you have every option in the world at your fingertip and every plug-in and all that stuff, it's awesome, but I, I, and then you were talking about guitars and having good guitars and stuff. While I agree with you on most levels, for me, I would rather find a way to make a really crappy sounding old K bass or guitar do something unique and interesting on its own, especially for bass when I played bass a lot. Um, I always thought the tone of a weird 60s bass was more interesting than a super high-end, um, you know, I call them furniture basses that are you know, six <laughs> strings and all this stuff. That's the best thing I've heard to describe that, the furniture bass. Yeah. That's spot on. They're ama and they're amazing works of art and all that stuff, yeah. but for me, and unless you're playing jazz, I find them stunting yeah you know because uh, I, I always feel like you get the best out of somebody by getting them to struggle with whatever they're dealing with if it's your own voice and then i think john lennon always said his favorite thing or or not john lennon uh, bono said about john lennon he enjoys hearing him sing twist and shout because he's not quite hitting the notes all the time and there's a struggle to that and i think the struggle part is what a lot of people today don't have to deal with with gear because they can just get these amazing things up immediately. Yeah. Okay, well, what are you going to say with that? Mm. You know? And so still it's all about being moved emotionally by whatever you're creating. And hopefully people are finding, and they are, finding unique ways to use these tools and, and do something different. I played a Hofner bass on the Jellyfish record that was an amazing instrument on the Spilt Milk record, the second record by Jellyfish. But the intonation about past the seventh or eighth fret, you just have to stop and retune it and just play that <laughs> passage and then retune, stop and retune it. It just was, there just were not really well made basses right. that had the ability to do the things that a lot of people want to do. And even some of McCarthy's stuff, you can hear them going sharp. And, yeah. And there is a little bit of a character to that, but there's a, and that's the fine line where you have to be careful. Sam, I have a question for you. What would you say to, younger musicians who are, are, you know, maybe in their late teens, early twenties who are wanting to get into being a, maybe a hired gun musician or a full-time player as someone who's been around in, in this game for a while. What do you think somebody who's coming into this nowadays needs to know, needs to understand, needs to be prepared for? Um, there's no jobs left. That's all I can <laughs> say. Uh, <laughs> Don't I, even try it. Now, I think that, uh, look, everybody has nowadays the ability to go, like we were saying, get really good gear. You can watch their videos about what's good to, how to plug things in and do all that stuff. And that's all great and helpful. I think the things that are most important about getting into this is about 85% of being on the road or being getting a gig is just how you are around other people and how you can hang with other people. Um, because you really are in each other's back pockets all the time. And uh, Jeremy Stacy is a dear friend of mine. He's a drummer who played with me in, in Cheryl's band and in uh, Noel's band, and he now plays in King Crimson. Um, he's like a brother to me, but there were there are moments where I couldn't stand him and want to, and I think I literally did punch him once in the face in Austin, Texas. But, you know, you develop these, these uh, relationships with people that you have to be prepared to, you know, touring is, you kind of have to 
be willing to put up with whatever you, you, you couldn't even think of some of the things you're going to have to deal with. And that mindset is sort of like being a gypsy, I guess, but just be prepared for that. You know, it's not, there's no roadmap to it. Even on the high end level of things, when you're moving and traveling, stuff changes all the time and be ready for that and be ready to take on weird uh, circumstances and, and adapt to them pretty quickly because people will just leave you behind if you're not, or they'll get somebody else. It's very easy to do that. Oh, totally. There's, a, there's always somebody ready to take your gig if you're not a good hang, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I've seen really amazing players lose gigs because of that, just because of their personality or, or whatever. And they even knew it. That, you know, and every, every great player that I played with has their own ups and downs and stuff. I always think being a sideman or whatever is like being a chameleon, and you figure out what's the weak thing in the band or in the dynamic of the emotions of everybody in the band. It's not just about how you play. You can change the way you play in any in a different group. If it's more of a jammy group and, and it's getting too jammy, you need to realize that it's time to lock into a rhythm section playing situation if it's just everybody's noodling all the time. It's always being aware of what, what's happening because that's what music is, is reacting to what you're hearing. And being on the road is the same way you're reacting to where you're going what you're doing. Let me ask you this. You're a great singer. How important is it as a sideman to be, to be able to sing? I've been really lucky because I got to play and sing with some really good singers. Um, if you so didn't have that ability, would that have hindered your ability to yeah. get any gigs? Yeah, and there are some great musicians that I've put up for gigs, but they didn't get them because they couldn't sing. Yeah. And I actually don't think singing is as difficult to do. Now, I say that because I can sing, but I, I, think, I think people out there that aren't sure if they can sing, just, just go for it. You know, I think there's plenty of things you can do. If you've got an ear to hear things in tone and, and pitch, that singing should be able you've to You've never hear. heard Rhett sing. It's a little bit of this. You yeah. Know, but it's it's when you... It's like anything. It's just you got to practice yeah. and do it. I know that in Jellyfish, it's four singers singing four-part harmonies, and we had to practice and rehearse every day to keep that going. And our sound engineer, Shalom, was almost the fifth member of the band because yeah. he was a singer. And he could hear things like, Tim, your R is not as hard as everybody else's, and you need to make that syllable. Shalom was it was a pretty particular guy, though. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Great. I mean, incredibly good sound. sound yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, um, it's just one of those things where it seems like it's a drag, or if you don't feel like you're, you're good at it, you just have to kind of keep pushing through that. Yeah. You know, and even, even for ways that you, like, when I was playing with Cheryl Crow. I used to sing higher harmonies than her that she had recorded on the record, but I had to recreate these super high harmonies. I was I able remember. to do that. Yeah. But part of it was I had to just let go of my ego and say, this is, I know I'm singing a duet with a girl that's about girls and <laughs> sound like I'm a girl. <laughs> but it's, you're just, it's a character, you know, that you're putting on and you're just trying to bring the, the part of the song over and I had to change the way that I sang. So I was telling Rick earlier today, I, I follow a couple of musicians that I've always liked, Andy Partridge from XTC and um, Robin Hitchcock on Twitter. And both of them I really love following for different reasons. Robin Hitchcock is this surreal uh, kind of poet guy. He just writes these ridiculous uh, tweets that are awesome. So that's one way. And then Andy Partridge has most recently been sort of transcribing some of his more famous guitar parts for people to, to pick out, which is great. Because um, he's always sort of been a, a, an aloof kind of guy. So they're both using that to, to be um, relatively in the, in the mainstream for however they want to be. And they're connecting with fans. I know that one of the big things that's happening with touring now is fan experiences or... You know, you come to the sound check and you sit there and watch us play, or you come and we everybody meets beforehand, or the, yeah. And now there's companies that are you know having these lavish meals and all this other crap that we would see, and it's just, I mean, I I understand what it is as an experience, and even in like the pledge music um, uh, model of putting out records, I'm in the middle of doing a, a a record with Roger Manning and Eric Dover from my Jellyfish days that we were approached by Pledge Music because Roger's put out things on his own. Mm -hmm. But most of what he's had to do with that project have been things that people have bought, like, oh, uh, co-write a song with Roger, or he'll 
do a piano score, a vocal arrangement, or whatever. So these other things that you have talent at, at you can exploit in these different ways. And, and that's kind of hopeful, you know, and that artists, I can say, oh, how did Andy Partridge play Earn Enough for Us on guitar? And there he's, he's doing that. You know, he should probably have a channel and do that because he's a pretty engaging dude. But um, I'm glad that you're embracing the technology, but you're also a teacher. You have something to say that people want to hear. I think what... Part of what I see in social media are artists that are just pointing a camera at themselves and going, hey, this is where I am today. And it's all it's all about them in a way that I just don't find engaging. You've got to have something that's interesting and unique and different for people to want to continue to watch you. The idea that people are going to sit and live their life watching you live your life is kind of like <laughs> a failure, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Well, I also think, too, that this is the answer to what we've seen in the last few years. If you just look at the guitar industry and how there's been this kind of everybody's freaking out. Oh, guitar sales are down. Guitar is finally dying. The, the younger generations are not picking up instruments anymore. I don't necessarily see that because of Instagram. You have these young people on Instagram who are coming up just some smoking players that are 16, 17 years old and, and, and even younger in some cases that now have a platform and an outlet to then inspire other people. You know, if when I was learning guitar at 12, 13 years old, I had Instagram and YouTube, I think I would be a much more, I don't think I'd be a better musician. I think I, I would have a more developed ear than uh, I do now just by being able to see and hear and be exposed to so much different stuff at, in an instant. So, you know, I think that you have a better ear when, when you had to actually drop the needle on the... Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, and I was kind of maybe disagree with you from my own experience because when I was your, at that age, at 10 and 11, and I've said this to you before, it's like you had to go out of your way to find a record store or a shop you could get a magazine that would have a band that somebody was talking about. You're always going to be pricking your ears up for things that are going to move you. I don't think that goes away at any age. In fact, I think the opposite has happened now, that there's so much available to everybody that it's just a saturation point of how can you even pick out anything of value? It has to be so ridiculously different for anybody to go, well, hang on, the, the bass player, the rhythm section was actually pretty badass. But I, I just, I guess my point is, is that we have so much available to us and there was something about taking the record out of the record sleeve. It had a smell to it. You put it on, you had to take care of it differently. It wasn't just track seven on my, on this. No. Whatever. If you left your record in the car on a hot day, it was done. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you were connected to it, uh, what's the word, tacitly with no, your hands? Tactily. Tactily. Yeah. Um, and you were connected to that and, and it meant more to me. Uh, because you could see it. It was the size that artwork could have a, an impact visually. Um, I miss those days. <laughs>